Hi, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. In our series, Sacred Conversations, we're beginning with our own personal walks with Christ. It begins with knowing that you are saved and being filled with the Holy Spirit yourself and then following that Holy Spirit's prompting to begin the sacred conversation. When you are saved, you proclaim Jesus as Lord, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know that you are saved. This means that you will also know that the person you're leading to Christ is also going to be saved. But how does that manifest itself? Churches have a long history of abuse in this regard, thinking in terms of the Holy Spirit's presence exclusively as an emotional manifestation. What if I have the sacred conversation with somebody, I lead them to Christ, and then there are just no emotional fireworks? How do I know that I know that I know? Well, let's begin right here. Here's 1 John 4.13. This is how we know we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. This is how we know. For context, the Epicureans and the Stoics, the Gnostics, whose thoughts and philosophies were prevalent in the first century uh, and still persist today, though under different names, had infiltrated the church. They're the ones responsible for the false gospels found in Nag Hammadi, used by Dan Brown, whose novels I've read, by the way, The Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons and all that stuff. Um, he's a great fiction writer. These were written by Gnostics in a futile attempt to stop Christianity from growing in its infancy. They infiltrated the church and pretended to be Christians who had been given special knowledge, hence Gnostic, you know, as in gnosko, meaning knowledge. Like, I know, I know, gnosko, it's Greek. And the Gnostics had done this successfully. They had come into churches and convinced them, like, look, I've been given special knowledge, you need to follow me and not the apostles, not the teachings of Jesus. They had attempted to add on to scripture. That is the classic formula for heresy, to take the word of God and add on to it, going all the way back to the serpent in Eden. So John was writing to the church to help them distinguish who the Gnostic false teachers were from what the, uh, those who were giving the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know that you're actually saved, not because you've been given some sort of special knowledge like the Gnostics may have claimed, but because you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's why he opens this verse, this is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. Like we saw in yesterday's devotion, Romans 8, 9, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not in Christ but you have the Holy Spirit, so you know you are His. The word remain is critical to this verse. I've given a verse-by-verse -verse teaching of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in another context. Um, I'll see if I can get video of it. But here is, here is just one little piece of 1st John. I don't, mind, uh, I don't mind isolating pieces of 1st John because it's more staccato structure, renders it kind of like the Proverbs, where the text that comes before and the text that comes after um, are not absolutely necessary to understanding what a singular verse says, but this comes in a, in a context of how we know God through love, all right? Um, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and His love is made complete in us. Then comes today's verse, this is how we know we remain in Him, and He in us, He has given us of His Spirit verse 14, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in Him. So these are just some snippets from the pericope the text that comes before and after, I want to zoom in on verse 13, and I want you to also notice from the pericope that the word remains is thematically ubiquitous in this whole series of books. Remain. It's not just that you had like an episodic encounter with Christ. It's not like you went to a church service and you cried a bunch and you came down to the altar. No, you have since remained in Him. Your steadfastness, your perseverance, your tenacity, 
your faithfulness, even enduring scorn and the scorch of the sun that comes out in the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower describes some people who receive the gospel initially with gladness, and then the very first time they face pressure for being a Christian, according to Jesus' own explanation of the parable thereafter, they wither away. And they're going out from us shows that they never really were among us. Remain in Christ steadfastly, regardless of emotional state. The heart makes a horrible compass, it is said. It's true. Jeremiah would say that the heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart can seriously desire that you leave your spouse because you're tired of dealing with your stupid marriage. But guess what? That is a catastrophic atom bomb in your life, in your spouse's life, in your children's lives. Take it from somebody who's worked with thousands of students across the U.S. I cannot tell you, cannot tell you the huge amount of damage that's been left in the wakes of divorces. It's immense and it lasts for years. Your heart can be steadfastly set upon something really stupid. Your heart can be deceived immensely by emotion. But what the Word of God gives you is from on high. It's from the author of time itself, the one who determined what north and south are, the inventor and arbiter of all compasses everywhere. He's the one giving you what you know to be true. Remain in Him. You know that you remain in Him. That's how verse 13 begins. If He has given you from the Holy Spirit, so this is how you know that you know that you know that you are saved. And this is how you will know that you know that you know as far as you can, the person you're leading to Christ is saved. Do not try to say no for someone when it comes to the gospel. It will be evidenced later in their lives to some extent in ways that we cannot see and will not know for sure if they remain in Him. Now, some of them may make a proclamation of faith, remain in Him, and look a lot like a Christian their whole lives. I've seen it. In fact, Jesus told us this. The wheat and the weeds look a lot alike. But we don't try to separate the wheat from the weeds because in doing so, inevitably, you might accuse someone of being a false believer in the Greek of 1 John, a pseudo martyreo. Hear the word martyr in that? a pseudo martyreo, a, a false believer. They look kind of like a believer, but they're not really one. If you try to do that work yourself, you are inevitably going to accuse a true believer of not really being a believer at all. So instead, you let the weeds and the wheat grow together. And in that parable, we see that God is the one who separates the wheat from the weeds. God is the one who separates the sheep from the goats. God is the one who knows the true heart. So you may lead one person to Christ who seems to just be utterly over the moon and ecstatic. They're like, I'm gonna go start an orphanage right now. You know, they were saved for five minutes. And then by that weekend, they have run full speed back into their sin with no intention of ever repenting, even kind of embarrassed about it and untagging themselves in the photos where they show up in the background at the Redemption Church, okay? Like, wow, that looked really promising at first. And then you might, and this I've, I've experienced this, lead someone to Christ, and there seems to be no emotion involved at all. You know, it seems, it seems like, you know, this is almost sort of, well, obvious, yes. Jesus is Lord. I see that. <laughs> like, I can see that guy's face right now. He's been walking with Jesus for over a decade now, <laughs> you know? Uh, and he's been bearing fruit, and he's been participating in church, you know? And then meanwhile, the, some of the people who just, who, who seemed overly ecstatic in the moment of their salvation are nowhere to be seen. This is how we know we remain in Him. He has given us of His Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yes, oftentimes is accompanied by emotion. And it is good. It is good. The particular emotion that's named in Scripture is peace. We saw that in Romans chapter 8. That that's that's an emotion that's experienced. If peace is merely an emotion, I think it's kind of reductionist. There's more to peace than merely an emotion, but it is described as peace. So you, it, I think that you will experience peace when someone is truly saved. 
but you don't know and you can't know. You know if you have the Holy Spirit of God convicting you, prompting you, the one who told you to bring the thing up in the first place, but the person with whom you're sharing the gospel, they're going to have the same spirit in them. And it will often be accompanied by emotion, but it emotion ought not be the rubric by which you determine whether or not this person is saved. You will see later if they remain in him. And at the end of days, God's the only one who knows our true hearts. He's the one who separates the wheat from the weeds. Judas evidently was a fantastic evangelist. <laughs> I can't speak scripturally to any of the fruit that he bore directly, but I know that he was commissioned along with the other 11 disciples, temporarily imbued as apostles, even with the authority to work miracles for a season. So we won't know until the end of days. What we do know is if we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit of God. And if we lead somebody else to Christ, they're going to have the Holy Spirit of God. They will then remain in Him. They will endure the coming scorching sun. It could be then that evangelists in Seattle are just as effective as evangelists in the Deep South. The difference being that people are, who are pseudo martyreo are quicker to wither here than they are in the South because there's a huge amount of cultural pressure not to be a Christian here. It could be that someone in the South who leads a thousand people to Christ has really only led 50, which is no small thing, by the way. But I do this to point out the numbers disparity, it seems. Like, what is it about that soil? <laughs> you know, they're like the Holy Spirit moves there, but not here. It very well could be that the sun spiritually is more scorching here, ironically. I grew up in Florida, go over 100 degrees for multiple days on end during the summertime. But the sun scorches more here in cloudy and rainy Seattle because there's a cultural pressure against Christianity. And if somebody doesn't have the Holy Spirit, they're not saved. If they hear the gospel at first, even if it's accompanied by emotionalism, they're going to wither away like that. As soon as the pressure comes, when they go to report to work at Amazon and HR walks around handing out the rainbow pins, like you're going to see real quick whether or not they're going to withstand the scorching heat of Seattle, ironically. You see what I mean? So it, it could be that we in Seattle as evangelists are just as actually fruitful as those who share their faith in the Deep South. In fact, it's quite likely that in cities where you have over 80% of the population professing to know Christ, and yet the crime rate and everything else is, is just as, is, is, is through the roof, like it very well could be that the majority of that 80% are pseudo martyreo. Those people may have professed Christ, and they may check a box on a survey or on their social media profile, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not repenting from sin. They're, they feel no conviction for sin. They may even exhibit emotionalism at first, but they don't remain in Him. Let this be an encouragement to you. When you lead someone to Christ, it can be an emotional moment. It won't always be. Don't let that be your litmus test to determine what's true and what's false. There's nothing in Scripture that says that you have to gauge your standing with God based on how you feel. What Scripture does say is that you know you're His when you have the Holy Spirit.